Hi guys, welcome to another Monday night live stream. We've been going through some of the prophecies uh, because of the current war going in Israel and looking at some of the things that are supposed to happen in Israel or with Israel in the end times. And we started talking about uh, the war in Gaza with Hamas, the specific Hamas prophecies. And then we talked about Lebanon, this, something to happen there. And then we talked about uh, Iran out of uh, Jeremiah 49 and um, Enoch 56, I believe. So today I wanted to keep going with that. And the prophecies concerning the Golan Heights, and that may or may not have anything to do with the current war, but just wanted to kind of look at this. So if we go to the book of Micah, the prophet Micah, he gives them some very interesting uh, details. And most of, most of the time, these things are overlooked. So in Micah chapter 5, and let me make sure I get this in here so we can see it. There we go. So in Micah chapter 5, it says, now gather yourself in troops, O daughter of troops. He has laid siege against us, and they smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. So this is an interesting prophecy. We know the judge of Israel is the Messiah. Smiting him with a rod on the cheek is mentioned in the Gospels. So we're talking about the crucifixion. Okay. So gather yourself in troops, O daughter of troops. He has laid siege against us. That's similar to the prophecies out of Isaiah 29 and others about how God was angry with Israel, kind of sided with the, with the nations around her and allowed them to win and banished Israel from their land. So this was in the first century AD. So this is what we're talking about here. So the troops are obviously the Roman legions. Okay, so they gather together, lay siege against Jerusalem, and then because of the fact that the judge of Israel, the Messiah, came to them at the appointed time, the time of visitation, and they crucified him, which starts off, I mean, it's one thing to even kill somebody, but to smite him with a rod on the cheek. We know all about the, the crucifixion, the crown of thorns, um, the pulling of the beard, the cat of nine tails, all that kind of stuff that happened. So it says this. Now, it backs up and begins to continue talk about the judge of Israel. And this is the one, Micah 5.2, which is quoted by Matthew, uh, proving the virgin birth. And it says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you're little among the thousands of Judah, it's a very, very small town, Yet out of you will come forth unto me, he who is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Now, Matthew quotes this first part of it. So down here, this part here, and basically says that that proves that Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem and, and this kind of stuff. And he's talking about that in the very beginning of the Gospels. And what they don't uh, mention exactly is whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting, or from ancient times, or from eternity. And the word here is RK. And what's really cool, if you, it's kind of a side note, but if you're reading uh, first, second, and third John together, uh, there's several places in the epistles of John where he talks about we know he's Messiah. We've talked with him, we've ate with him, we've handled him. And several places it talks about, we know him who is from the beginning. And it's a very important phrase that John repeats over and over again. And most people notice that, but they don't realize why. Well, this right here, when it says from Arche, uh, and that's Greek, I'm talking about the Septuagint. The word in the Septuagint here, or from old, from everlasting, is the same as from the beginning in John. So when you look at the Greek, the Greek here of Micah 5.2 and the Greek phrases in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, you can see that he's quoting this passage. And he's saying, we've seen him, handled him, ate with him, touched him with our hands. He who is from the beginning, the one Micah 5.2 prophesies about. 
So it's really interesting to kind of pull that together. So from this, we understand Messiah is God incarnate. He's from eternity past. So he is before anything that was ever created. This also goes along with John 1.1. 1, 1. So this is the one who incarnates now in human form and is a baby born in Bethlehem. So Bethlehem is the, the key to the whole thing right here. So putting one and two together, you've got the fact that the God, uh, separate from the Father, but however that works is what they would tell you. Uh, Jesus incarnates in human form. He's born in Bethlehem. He's from eternity past, so we know who we're talking about. And because he's the judge of Israel, they turn on him and smite the judge of Israel, Israel with a rod upon the cheek. And because of that, God calls in the troops, the daughter of troops, and lays siege against Jerusalem. Jerusalem rejects Messiah. God rejects Jerusalem. So that's what's going on here. Now, we understand that pretty well. That's been uh, mentioned a lot. But when we get to verse 3, it says, He will therefore give them up until the time that she travails has brought forth. So this is an old, uh, another idiom. We see it through the Old Testament in a lot of places. The entire idea, first, he will give them up until a certain time. So he has, they've laid siege against them and they are, uh, the land, the nation is destroyed until a certain time. Well, you and I know that certain time is 1948 when Israel returned as a nation. And there's many prophecies about that. So he will give them up until 1948, which is the time when she who travails has brought forth. So in this case, we're talking about the reestablishment of the nation of Israel. Then at that time, the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel. So we're not going to have uh, Israelites and Judahites anywhere. There's not going to be two states, a Judah and an Israel. There's just one state. So that's what's going on. That gets us up to 1948. So now this next part here is what we want to look at, the prophecies about the Golan Heights. <clears throat> says that he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, they shall abide. For now shall be great, he shall be great unto the ends of the earth. So this is either talking about Christianity going forth over the centuries or referring to the millennial reign. It's probably referring to the millennial reign if you think about it. So that's what's going to happen. So basically, we're going from the time that they were given up to the time they were brought back. And then from the time they were brought back to the time of the millennial reign is what these next verses are going to be talking about. So from 1948 to the year whenever, uh, when the second coming occurs, second coming rapture, whatever, probably second coming, this, this entire area before the kingdom. During this time period, these events will take place. So verses 5 and 6 are about 1948 to the present and in the next few years. So verse 5 says, uh, This man shall be the peace when the Assyrian shall come into our land. Okay, now first you look at this and you say, well, the Assyrian is a title or a name for the Antichrist. And I'm not saying anything about Syria or Assyria or the people. We're talking about in, in the Old Testament, he's called the Egyptian or the Pharaoh, rather the Pharaoh, the Tyrrhenian, the Assyrian, the Syrian, and I think a great one of Lebanon, I think. And there's several other titles. Basically, we know the Antichrist comes from a country north of Israel. And so we're talking now about that particular time. So in this time period, or even before this time period, the Antichrist will come down, but also there's going to be multiple attacks from the Assyrian Empire or the where the Assyrian Empire used to be. Assyria was probably the oldest one, original one before even Babylon. So that's what we're referring to. 
So we're talking about, um, in general, nations attacking Israel, but specifically to the north. So in the north area of what used to be the Assyrian Empire today, we have Lebanon, we have Syria, and we have a small part of Iraq. So up there in that area is where the Antichrist will come from, where enemies of Israel will come from, etc. So when the Assyrian that and it doesn't doesn't really matter who it could be Iraq attacking Syria attacking Lebanon attacking with Hezbollah or some combination of the two or maybe even somebody higher up I mean further north so that area so when people from this area come in and attack our land okay uh, then he shall tread down our palaces then and, and and when he will tread down our palaces. Uh, then we, or then shall we raise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men. So this is really important. You understand this. A principal man shows you, number one, Israel at this point doesn't have kings anymore. They had kings all the way up to when they were banished by the Romans. When they came back in 1948 to the present, they have a... I don't want to say necessarily democracy or republic or whatever, but they have a, a form of government where the people elect and vote on and elect their, um, their leaders. Okay, so presidents and prime ministers and things like that. So to talk about principal man, it shows you're in this time period, there's no more kings that are born king, and that's just the way it is. You have to deal with it. So, but notice in this time period with this prophecy, there's going to be eight principal men. So let's go ahead and just say this. So if eight, if we have eight principal men that are elected that run Israel, the highest top, uh, I would say president if it's in the United States, their government's a little different. It's actually the prime minister that is like the head of the entire government uh, in that sense. So the eight principal men are eight prime ministers. So I want you to understand this. Now, a shepherd, a shepherd is somebody that watches over the flock. And when wolves come in, they destroy the wolves. They protect the sheep. So to put that in modern terms, seven shepherds would be seven generals or whatever they would be called over there. The, the person that if someone was to attack like Hezbollah or Gaza or whomever, Syria or whatever, uh, if they have someone come in and attack, there would be um, a general or a couple of generals or something that come together to form something. And for a while, while a war is going on, they're in charge, that kind of a thing. Now, you're still going to have the principal men actually dictating policy and commanding the generals to do something or not. But the person that runs the war is the top general or the shepherd. So there's going to be eight prime ministers and seven generals okay and at first you're thinking like how does that work shouldn't there be eight and eight or seven and seven now there's specifically eight and seven for a reason it goes on and talks about these wars so there's if if they're not all at the same time like eight of them the war lasting decades or whatever there should be eight specific wars in which eight different prime ministers, or maybe there's more, but if the prime ministers are reelected and have to do the same war again, something like that, but there's eight prime ministers and seven generals that fight a series of wars. Now we have to figure out what wars we're talking about. This is what I get asked all the time. It's like, does this fit with this war? Not exactly, because it has to be a specific kind of land. So verse six says, they shall uh, waste the land of Assyria. Okay, so Assyria today would be Syria. We're not talking about the ethnic peoples of anything like Lebanese or Syrians or Assyrians or Iraqis. We're talking about the ancient land of what used to be Syria or Assyria. So it can be that whole area up there, but the majority of it is Syria. So the land between Syria. Okay, because um, it says the land of Assyria with the sword, so they will attack 
okay? Um, and it says, the land of Nimrod at the entrances thereof. Now, you first thought you look at this and the land of Nimrod would be Babylon, but Babylon is Iraq. That's like way over there. Uh, so basically what we're talking about is in ancient history, the extension of the empire of Nimrod came all the way to Mount Hermon. And you guys know the history of Mount Hermon, so you kind of know where we're going with that. But basically, uh, there is a, an old fortress. Right now, there's Mount Hermon. And it's uh, basically at the border of Syria and um, Israel. But anciently, there was a, in, the mid, in medieval times, there was a uh, Templar tower there. But it was built on a much older uh, tower which is said to be the tower or castle of Nimrod. Not that he lived there, but that's the extent of his, his empire. So when you're talking about laying waste the land of Assyria with the sword, all the way or just up to the land of Nimrod, the entrances thereof, or the borders thereof, you're talking about Mount Hermon, and you're talking about Syria. Okay, so that particular part of the land. Thus he shall deliver us from the Assyrian that he comes into our land when he treads down our borders. So let's kind of look at this. this that's the prophecy. And when you go from seven on forward, we start talking about the millennial reign. And then there's some other very interesting prophecies in here. But let's go ahead and look at this. And this is from our ancient prophecies revealed. Uh, the section of prophecies from 1948 to 1981. And this is the explanation with other, other things in here. But basically in this, as a matter of fact, let me see if I can get this a little bigger. So I mainly just want you to see this. There we go. Uh, so here's Lebanon. We looked at this the other week and we talked about how the Obadiah prophecy predicted southern Lebanon being taken by Israel and the new border being basically right here, the taking of Gilead. And we mentioned the Golan Heights, but it has nothing to do with Obadiah. So we didn't really delve into it. And then here's West Bank, stuff like that. So today we're not talking about Lebanon or Gilead. We're talking about ancient Bashan. And so if you want to look at all the prophecies connected with the Golan Heights area, just understand that's anciently called the land of Bashan or Bashan. And it's where Og lived. Remember, Og was the giant that Moses killed. So... Uh, in that area. So basically, if this is Syria at the entrances thereof and Mount Hermon is up here, then you're talking about um, Lebanon and Syria specifically, but most likely Syria. So you're talking about a series of wars between Israel and Syria where they take Syrian land. So like originally when this started right here would have been the border of Israel. Assyria invades, they take part of the land as a buffer, and then give it back, and Syria invades, not just Syria, but just several wars, and this keeps going back and forth, and finally now they've said this is the Golan Heights, and they're going to keep it. Now, whether that ever expands into more territory, well, actually it has to according to the prophecy, but right now it's been the way it is for, let's see, 20, 40 42 years, I think, is when the last time this was changed. So let's look at this. Um, remember, there's eight principal leaders and seven shepherds that have to do a fight between Syria and Israel over the Golan Heights area, is what Micah says. So I want to take up here and see if I have to. Okay, I have to run that back down now. There we go. So here is, I can do one up, just make it a little easier to see. Okay, so the very first time this started, Israel declared itself to be a nation. And uh, David Ben-Gurion was elected. Now, there wasn't time to actually form a government properly, to form a, uh, a shepherd, a, 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 uh, an army, uh, different things like that. They were attacked like few hours after they declared themselves as a nation. So David Ben-Gurion acted as both leader and shepherd that first time. It was that first war, 1948. When it was over, they had ca they 
took the land they're supposed to take, but they actually went up and took even more territory. And part of that was the Golan Heights area or a small part of the Golan Heights area. So this went along fine. And I forget which one in here, but somewhere, and it might be multiple times in between each one of these, but they tend to give back the Golan Heights area. Syria is now our friend. It's not going to happen anymore. Everything's fine. Just kind of put it back. So uh, that that goes on. And then in 1967, Levi Eshkol was the second leader, the second prime minister when Syria and others attacked. And so they took the Golan Heights area. OK, again, and this time it might be more or less time, you know, that kind of thing. But it was definitely a time between 1967, 1973, that they gave back the Golan Heights area. And what's interesting about this is during the time of the 1967 war under Levi Eshkol, the main general at the time was a guy named Moshe Dayan. Some of you will, will remember him. So he fought in the Six Day War and actually is responsible for taking militarily the Golan Heights. Well, politics comes in and the Golan Heights are given back. Okay, so then shortly thereafter, there is what's called the Yom Kippur War in 1973 and under Golda Meir. Currently, though, when this happens, Moshe Dayan is still the main general of the time. So under Golda Meir, Moshe Dayan took the Golan Heights militarily for the second time in his life. Very, very interesting. So then uh, everything is fine for a while. And then in 1981, Menachem Begum, there actually wasn't a war at this point. But in 1981, Menachem Begum comes on the scene. They decide that it will be permanent um, territory of Israel. And what they're going to do then is... is um, uh, take it and keep it, but there are certain parts that they have that aren't strategically important. So they give that back to Syria, and there's a couple of points like high mountain points that are strategically important that was Syrian, and they took control over it. So by definition, they actually take control of Syrian territory at that point, even if it's five feet, you know, they just took a certain place. So it, in this time, we have Ariel Sharon, um, at this point. And of course, he is responsible for the Golan annexation. And of course, he actually gives away uh, the, Golan, or the Golan annexation he takes. And he's actually also responsible later for giving away Gaza or making Gaza independent. Probably the biggest mistake Israel has made. So anyway, to, to pull this together, then we've got two leaders and then two leaders with one shepherd and then a leader and a shepherd. So this is how we have and why Micah says there are eight principal leaders and only seven shepherds, because one of them served under two leaders taking the Golan Heights twice. Now, the, the last four, and this is in the book, are this. So the last one should be the leader and the shepherd, same as David Ben-Gurion, but it's going to be the Messiah at the time of Armageddon. So very interesting. So we have... Uh, one war here, the seventh and the sixth, may actually be in the tribulation period. Don't know. So we have at least one more war, probably prior to the tribulation period, I would assume. And this could have something to do with that. But basically, so the whole concept from Micah 5, to bring it, bring it home with a nutshell, I'll go ahead and put these back so you can see them, is that there's going to be a baby born in Bethlehem who is from eternity. He's, he's God incarnate. He is smitten by the leadership and executed. So God turns on Jerusalem and hands it over to the Romans. They are expulsed. Okay, and then in 1948, they come back. The nation is reborn. She who is uh, in labor finally gives birth. And from the time of that birth, 1948, to the time of the second return of the Messiah, the starting of the kingdom, where it says the baby will reign throughout the entire planet, that's the kingdom. In that time period, there shall be 
a series of wars where eight leaders, prime ministers, and seven shepherds, generals, take territory. And this, these series of wars are between Israel and Syria. And so we're halfway there now, and another one may be starting. So these are just some of these prophecies, but that's Golan, one of one of the Golan Heights prophecies uh, from Scripture. And there's a lot more we could talk about and we do in the book, but um, a lot of other interesting things. But that's pretty much what I wanted to share with you. So some of the questions I have are, what about Netanyahu doing this or doing that? Uh, what if they take southern Lebanon, et cetera? With, by definition, and I could be wrong, but by definition, they're taking land in the Golan Heights to fulfill this prophecy. So if they took and kept Gaza or if they took and kept uh, southern Lebanon or both and didn't do anything with Syria, then this prophecy is still unfulfilled. Now, if they all happen at the same time, great. That's Obadiah, that's Amos and, and Micah all together. So those are the things to look for. So remember, uh, like we've seen under uh, the prophecies, there is a group called Hamas that tries to destroy Israel in the Ona that we live. So in the time period and understanding the Dead Sea Scroll calendar. At a certain time period, Israel takes and keeps southern Lebanon. And in another time period, it might be the same time period, but in, towards the end, we have these shepherd wars, eight of them specifically. And we've got at least four that have taken place. So we'll go ahead and stop there for tonight. That's basically what I wanted to share with you. And these are things that we don't talk about very much. And uh, we'll, we'll eventually talk about the um, Gog Magog invasion and things like that. And most people worry about, is it Russia? Is it Turkey? Is it something else? I think we can figure that out really easy. But even if we don't, that's not important. Whoever they are, when does it happen? How does it happen? Is it connected with this? How are the prophecies going to come together? It's like a lot of the people try to debate on who the two witnesses are. Is it Enoch and Elijah? Moses and Elijah? Moses and Enoch? Is it, you know, two other guys? Bottom line is, when do they do their stuff? What do they say? Who do we look for? Where are they at? So very interesting uh, set of stuff. We tend to get off on rabbit trails a lot. So at this point, I'm going to stop and I'm going to go to the chat and see if there's any questions. Um, first one is, uh, the Gog Magog motive is about money. I'm thinking after Israel's border is moved north at the end of this war, deep drilling technologies might find oil in the new Israeli land. And that's a possibility. There's been some rumors that I have heard, rumors, I don't know if they're true or whatever, that there might be oil in the Golan. Um, you know, maybe, maybe not. If for the longest time, they've always said Jordan doesn't have any oil. Um, and maybe that's because they're, you know, who knows? So far at the moment, the Jordanians have not drilled and found oil, put it that way. Israel has drilled and found gas, so they can make a lot of money with selling the natural gas. But they, um, I don't think they have found oil. Maybe they have. So anyway, we'll see how that goes. Um yeah, so when all this changes, the Israeli borders are going to be quite a bit different. So a lot of new things are going to happen. So very interesting. Um, is this prophecy when one to be fulfilled, if I understand correctly? Uh, the one we're talking about, yes, hasn't been. It's there, there would be eight wars. Four out of the eight have happened. So it's in process. This is kind of like um, Amir when he says, I think it was fulfilled. It, he, he, he believes that Psalm 83 was fulfilled, I think, in 67 or 48 or something like that. And, you know, it, it could be. But when I read Psalm 83, the, the main idea is, well, first off, it's not countries. It's terrorist groups in countries. So Egypt's not the problem, it's the Hagarenes. Lebanon is not the problem, it's the 
the cabal um, and, you know, each one of these, these subgroups. But at, in, in addition to that, the, the problem is, or the main point is, Asaph is writing this prophecy and Asaph says, Lord, would you finally make them like the Jebusites and the Canaanites? There are no more Jebusites and Canaanites to attack Israel. We will never, ever see any time a Canaanite army or a Jebusite army attack Israel because they simply don't exist anymore. So the prophecy is not, Lord, can you make all these people not exist, but can you make them the problem that they have like the Canaanite problem done once and for all? And so when you see these wars, um, like the shepherd prophecies we talked about today, it was 1948, 1967, 1973, and then a piece of that particular one, 1981. Uh, these same groups uh, keep attacking. And so right now we're having a war between Hamas and Gaza and Hezbollah in possibly Hezbollah in Lebanon and Israel in the middle. Uh, so it's the same kind of thing again. So we'll see what happens. But since you have nations or groups of people that keep coming back to fight, it doesn't seem like it's over. At least his prayer has not been answered yet because there's still people in those areas trying to kill him. I'm troubled and have a question. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm finding many Christians in my inner circle that are actually Israel haters. Interesting. <coughs> Let me take a drink here. Are Christians who hate Israel actually Christians? I am troubled. Um, possibly. People can be taught wrong. And I think that's interesting. If I go to a, a bad church or a church that just doesn't teach and I fall in with the wrong people, um, this kind of stuff. So, for instance, if Israel was the government, they allow Christians to have churches, Muslims to have mosques, Jews to have synagogues. Everything's fine. You never have them attacking, uh, for instance. So over here in the United States, our, our experience, how many you know people that shoot up schools or bomb churches or cause any kind of bombing or whatever, how many of them were Jewish and doing it for Israel or something like that? As far as I know, zero. How many of them were Christians trying to advance the Christian faith? As far as I know of, at least in my time, zero. Now, you can point to like the Ku Klux Klan. They claim to be Christian. There's always these subgroups that, that are terrorists that claim to be whatever. But how many of them are doing it for the glory of Allah or Islam? Uh, probably a good amount of them. So it's this kind of a thing. How, how many Buddhists do you know that are blowing up buildings? I don't know of any Buddhists that are blowing up buildings. Maybe, but I don't know of any. So it's interesting to kind of to kind of see that that the um, religions can get off. Uh, we know what the Quran says. We know what the Bible says. Um, you should follow your the religion. You should be should become Christian actually. Uh, but it is very weird when you have something like that. You know, like in my circles, I find people who seem to be solid Christians that are, um, they hate Democrats or they are a Democrat and they hate Republicans. And you kind of wonder how do they, you know, not taking sides, but how are they, you, you could see somebody being on both sides of something, but how do you be that hostile to each other? We all agree if you're killing women and children, that's wrong. It stops. We all should put a stop to it immediately. That's why we carry weapons, just put a stop to it. Um, but that's not got anything to do with religion, really. And if your religion dictates you should kill women and children, the religion is wrong. And whether it's religious or not, it still has to be stopped. So, yeah, there's a lot of strange things like that. I, I think I told the story about a friend of mine who was from southern Russia 
grew up there and was Orthodox, uh, Russian Orthodox. And I'm not saying all Russian Orthodox are this way, but it's his testimony was he grew up there and they all despise Jews because they, you know, reject Christ and, you know, this kind of stuff. I could kind of see that, I guess. But they all really despised the Jewish community in their area. And even talk to the, you know, the point of like, you ought to get rid of them, you know, this kind of stuff. And he was all into it. That's just the way it was. And he said one day, somebody in his circles said something about, I, you know, that they hated the Jews. And if they could, they would just take them out back, cut their heads off. And he realized that what started the conversation is some Jewish boys, not, not adults, kids had went by the store shop. And this guy was talking about if he could get away with it, he'd grab the kid and cut its head off. And at that point, my friend, he, he just totally flipped. He's like, whoa, wait a minute. I don't care what they are, or who they are. You don't, why on earth, how could you even have a thought like that to kill a kid? And then he began to realize that, okay, I'm not Jewish. I don't want to be Jewish. That's one thing. But this hostility is not right. He began to see even his heart. This isn't right. And he couldn't figure it out. So he starts reading the Bible. And it's interesting. He gets to Ezekiel 38 and sees about the Gog Magog invasion and realizes that's us. And he begins to realize it's got to be a demonic spirit in the area. So just because you go to a church or a synagogue or a mosque or you're an atheist or whatever, just because you are of a certain thought pattern doesn't mean you're correct, doesn't mean that you're godly or not demonically possessed. And he basically, you know, migrated to the United States. Last time I talked with him, he's living in Florida. Uh, so it's, it's a really interesting story that he tells. So that kind of stuff happens. So you could go to one church and, and that's why I, I encourage all of you guys, you know, go to a good church, no matter what it is. It doesn't really matter the denomination, but something that's conservative, that understands prophecy, that wants to study the Bible chapter by chapter, um, serious about it, not making up stuff as they go along. Um, so Calvary chapels are really good that way. I've been at a Calvary chapel for 20 some years. Most of you know, I go to Calvary chapel, Johnson County, which is in Olathe, Kansas. And I live close by, uh, this last week I was at, I, I got the privilege of speaking at Calvary chapel, Liberty, Missouri, uh, a friend of mine out there asked me to come speak. And so that was really cool. We had a lot of fun, but yeah. Um, I don't know if they're actually Christians or not. We definitely need to pray for them. I, I can never figure that stuff out. So when I pray for people like that, I pray that if they're saved, help them understand, help them get back on track. And if they're not saved, help them get saved. And it sure looks like they're not saved, but, you know, I don't know their heart. But something is drastically wrong if you can be like that. Uh, could you explain the fullness of the Gentiles and when and what that is? Um, it's a prophecy that Jerusalem would be trodden down of the Gentiles. It's a prophecy Messiah made in, in Matthew. <coughs> and it would be trodden down until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, and then it would no longer be uh, a problem city. So uh, some of us, like, for instance, uh, thought in 1948 that prophecy was fulfilled. Israel took over, but it didn't. That part did not manifest. Jerusalem was a divided city for, I think, 19 years until 1967. And they took back the entire city, including the Temple Mount. But even at that being the case, they still allow Muslim authorities to run the Temple Mount. And they haven't built their temple as part of a prophecy. But still, it's not completely finished. And it may not be for quite a while. But Jerusalem should be sovereign. And even if they did take total control and were sovereign, if that was fine for five or ten years and then there was a war, 
Gentiles again invade and try to take over, it's still actually part of that problem. So this this time in the fullness of the Gentiles is going to be the Gentile age before the kingdom age. Um, so I'm thinking this pertains to uh, watch for Jerusalem and it's going to go in stages. Israel comes back without Jerusalem. They instantly get half of Jerusalem. 19 years later, they get full Jerusalem. But because of political problems, they leave it alone. And it's been like that since 1967. So anyway, so we'll see what happens with it. Now, some people think about the fullness of the Gentiles, like when would that actually happen is when the last Gentile gets saved. Uh, like there's a specific number, and that may or may not be. But I think it's a good reason for us to witness to people. Um, I think we all want to go home, you know, or they want the kingdom to come. Do you think Zechariah 11.8, the three shepherds, I also cut off in one month, my soul loathed them, and their soul abhorred me, could be about the last three shepherds of this prophecy? It's possible. Anything that says shepherds, I would, well, if we look it up and it's the same word anyway. Uh, actually, even if it's not, I'd still look at it. But it very well could be any kind of a shepherd because it's the same concept, the one that takes care of the sheep. So he would be the general if we're talking about a nation. So, yeah, it, it's something to look into. I haven't looked into that, but it very well might be. I'm going to have to, someone else mentioned that to me before, though. So I'm going to have to really look at it, especially now with all this going on. Um, in regards to the two witnesses, I ask, what are the two witnesses of? Oh, they, they testify of Christ. And basically people argue, like I was saying, are they, you know, Enoch and Elijah, Enoch and Moses, Moses and Elijah, or whomever, or two guys that are in the spirit and power of Moses and Elijah. And so it's kind of debated on that. But more importantly, when do they witness what they say? how that kind of stuff goes. The prophecy in um, Malachi talks about, I will send Elijah the prophet before the day, great day of the Lord. So that's not back then. John the Baptist was a type back then. There will be actually an Elijah fulfilling that prophecy toward the end of our time period. And it says that he turns the hearts of the fathers to the sons and the sons to the fathers. And that indicates um, either like a civil war going on or, you know, a segregation or some sort of a problem. But we've had a problem for 2,000 years. The Pharisees and the Sadducees mistaught the Jewish nation into rejecting Messiah. And now since the Dead Sea Scrolls have come back, many people are beginning to understand that was a mistake. Not the majority yet, but I think it's, it's actually getting there. So we're going to have someone, I'm sure, use the scrolls and the other histories to prove what happened. And eventually, as Paul says in Romans 9, all Israel will be saved. So I think we're seeing the beginnings of that actual prophecy also. Do you think that these things might be fulfilled during the gap? Maybe 38 years. Uh, the recapitulation of the book of Joshua plus 7 leaves a nice spot um possibly yeah the the first time when we had this we had messiah uh crucified 32 a.d and we had almost 40 years before the destruction of the temple and almost 45 years between that and the end of the age uh total between messiah's death and the end of the age um so there's always these gaps or visitation periods one Anciently was 120. This one's 40. Ours is supposed to be seven, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls. So that's why we put those together as a type of tribulation period. Um, so some of these might be uh, fulfilled before. Uh, four have been. I, I'm thinking one or two more before the tribulation period. And then uh, one or two uh, after or during the tribulation period. Because there's lots of things that could occur. It talks about the Antichrist causing multiple wars and many nations fall. So there could be a whole bunch of stuff like that. Okay, we got one more question here. It says, if Iran jumps in 
and declares war on Israel, can multiple prophecies happen at the same time? Yeah, definitely. Uh, Obadiah is just simply telling us they keep and take, or they take and keep southern Lebanon, and they control the coast down to Egypt. That's actually two, and there's three or four other prophecies in Obadiah. And then this one talks about Golan Heights area with Syria, just that part. And then um, Enoch 56 and um, Jeremiah 49 talk about the war with Israel, with uh, Israel and between Israel and Iran. So it, it kind of looks like it. I mean, right now, uh, we're close to the end time, so it almost has to fit in there somehow. But if, and this is just what I hear, I'm not there, I don't know for sure, but if Iran is funding, uh, training, giving weapons to Syria for the purpose of training, giving weapons to Hezbollah, so they can give some weapons to Hamas, and then Hamas and Hezbollah want to attack Israel, Syria probably does too. And even if Iran didn't, uh, it just, they're all connected in that sense. Um, if we find out that most of the weapons are actually Russian, I'm not saying they are, I'm saying if we found that out, that might be a reason to pull Russia into the war. That could be the Gog Magog war of Ezekiel 38. So it's possible all of them are connected. And if all of them are connected, I can see Damascus going up in smoke in a single night. Uh, which is Isaiah 17. So these may be separate wars, or they may be all together, but I just want us to all be aware of these things. So Isaiah 17 for the Damascus prophecy, uh, Jeremiah 49 and Enoch 56, uh, very specific prophecies about Iran, Obadiah for the Lebanon prophecy, and, and partially the Gaza Strip, and the Negev, and then uh, Amos 6 and the other Hamas passages about the Gaza Strip. And so we've, we've done four videos so far uh, on those subjects since the war started. So we'll go back and look at those. Oh, two more, pa two more popped up. So let's try to get these here. Have you seen the videos of the sky trumpets? Like the one in Jerusalem in 2016. Oh, where the, just the sound occurred? Yeah. Could this worldwide phenomenon be angels preparing to sound like a symphony of tunes? Uh, are they, or possibly are they fallen? Um, when you go back and you look at the fall of Jerusalem uh, with Eusebius, ecclesiastical history, church history, Christian church history, and like Josephus, who's a secular Jewish Pharisee type history, and then other people. Uh, with the fall of Jerusalem, there are some very interesting details that seem like fiction, like people see things in the air and they hear sounds uh, like fighting, even though there's no one around here fighting and things like that. And so all of a sudden now we're hearing trumpets in different places. And the skeptics are saying it's just the way the air pressure is. It creates a rhythmic sound and we kind of hear that kind of stuff. And yeah, that's nice. Maybe that is exactly how it works. But question is, why haven't we never heard this before? How does it start now all of a sudden? Well, smog, you know, okay, well, maybe. Uh, but still, is it something like what happened back then? Like, for instance, back then they talked about uh, some sort of uh, gas or something under the Temple Mount, like natural gas or whatever. And when they tried to do certain things, it would start fires easy. Well, maybe that was it. Maybe it was uh, spiritual. So you never know about that kind of stuff. So I've heard about it. I can't really say anything to it uh, for or against. I remember Gary Stearman was, was mentioning one time that he thought it was very interesting for something like that to be happening. Um, okay. Uh, super sticker, $50. Thank you very much. We really appreciate all you guys that listen. And if you can't afford to support us, that's perfectly fine. Uh, if you can, <clears throat> we've got a lot of books you can buy and give to your people, use for Bible studies, give to your pastors. Uh, you can support us on Give, Send, Go. And we also have a PayPal account. 
and uh, through these things. So we really, really appreciate all that stuff. We're able to go further, uh, translate more scrolls the, the quicker we can in that way. So I want to thank you all for doing that very much. What does Jeremiah 31, 22 mean? Let me look it up. Um, let's see here. Jack Van Empey, I am not. Remember Jack Van Empey? He was supposed to have the entire Bible memorized. Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah. Where's Jeremiah? There he is. 31 and 22. I really know my way around the Bible. I just... Somehow you get older and things stick. So anyway, 22. How long will you go about backsliding daughter? For the Lord has created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall compass a man. Um, I'm not sure what that is, but that, that could actually be really interesting. One of the texts in the um, Dead Sea Scrolls talks about the prophecy of backsliding Israel. And it was saying that it is a specific prophecy about the Sadducee Pharisee movement in Israel back in the day. And so here, with that in mind, it makes all this stuff kind of come alive a little bit more. We've got a backsliding daughter. Uh, and the Lord creates a new thing. So if they're connected, Israel is Israel. A daughter is something born from a person. So the daughter of Israel very easily could be Christianity. Like in the prophecy in Zephaniah, it talks about the daughter of the dispersed ones bringing the, the offering, which a lot of us think is the Ark of the Covenant or some sort of a piece of the Ark of the Covenant uh, from Ethiopia. But it's interesting because you've got the dispersed ones being the Falasha Jews. The daughter of the dispersed ones, by that definition, would be the Ethiopic Coptic Church comes directly from them, but it's a daughter, a break off, uh, went from Jew Judaism to Christianity. So the Falasha Jews, the majority are back in Israel, not the Christian part, of course. And the Christians then would be the ones that would have this object that they give as a gift once the Messiah returns. So very, very interesting. So there's a backsliding daughter, could be Christian or Messianic movement or something that Kind of messes up. The Lord created a new thing on the earth that a woman shall encompass, shall compass a man. So I'm not sure. Um, my first thought on that would be the idea that women, you know, stay at home. They don't do things as the way it has been for thousands of years. Now everybody's on equal footing. The the ladies may go out and make even more money than the guys. You know, it could be could be a whole bunch of stuff. That in itself would be a sign because our society has changed in a way that it never has before. So that very well could be. Um, another thing we'd have to look at, Jeremiah 31 has got some interesting things in it. So, okay, we'll go ahead and say good night uh, for this point. We'll be back next week and continue on some more of these prophecies. So God bless you guys and we'll see you next week.